Hello and welcome to this tutorial on double Q learning. So I haven't done one of these in a long time. So if you don't know what's going on, you don't know Q learning, uh, feel free to look at the rest of the tutorial series before you jump into this. But even if you haven't watched, if you know Q learning and you're just interested purely in uh, double Q learning, I'm going to be going over the theory behind it um, and the code. Uh, so, you know, do whatever suits you, uh, watch the previous ones or don't. Um, but that's what we're doing this time, double Q learning. So I guess we should start off with the question of what is double Q learning and why do we need it? Um, and actually the latter here is probably the better question to start with. Why do we need it and what's it trying to solve? So let me actually bring up the original paper right here. I have it um, for double Q learning. This is actually quite an old paper, well, old in terms of uh, deep reinforcement learning, 2015, maybe even before that, this is on archive. So essentially what's happening here, if, if you want to feel free to read it, it's a good paper. I'll have it in the description. Um, but what this paper tries to deal with is the fact that when we're using Q learning, Q learning algorithms tend to overestimate Q values. Um, and they have a whole section talking about why this is the case. Uh, but briefly going over this, essentially what's actually happening is every time we estimate a Q value, well, we're trying to learn what the Q value is, right? That's why we're trying to predict it so we can change your estimation. Um, so it's never gonna be exactly right. We're always gonna have some error. Um, sometimes it will be too low, sometimes it will be too high, um, and sometimes it will be about right. But the issue is that in Q learning, this is this is our uh, sort of function, our loss function right here, right? Or almost, this is what our, ex, this is what we're trying to train the Q function to be, right? It's the reward plus the next steps discounted Q value. Um, the issue with this is remember when we're training, we always take the max Q value. And the reason for that, right, is because we're, we're assuming we're going to take whatever state gives us the best Q value because that's the best path to take. Um, the issue with this is you could guess that, let's say we have like four different actions, right? Um, and each one is roughly equally likely, or rather they all have roughly equal Q values. So it really doesn't matter uh, which action we take. They all have about equals values. Um, anyone should be fine. Well, Remember what I just said, right? None of them are going to be exactly equal because, uh, or probably not because we're estimating them. Um, and so even, even if they should all be roughly equal in a, in a real game, uh, you know, we're going to have some error. So some might be too high, some might be too low. Um, and because of this max right here, we're always going to end up taking the actions uh, with the highest Q value, uh, regardless of whether or not they were just higher due to some error. Um, and we also do underestimate, but we're never going to take those values, right? So essentially, this is what we're training our new Q values to be. And we're essentially training them to be the Q values that were overestimated lots of the time. So essentially, we have this compounding problem in Q tra like training Q algorithms, uh, where the Q values tend to get a little bit ridiculous and really overestimate uh, what's actually what they actually should be. We can take a quick look down at this, let's see, at this graph really quickly. Um, just jump into the results real quick. Let me zoom in a little bit here. This is actually uh, a few games. So the blue line here you can see is with double Q learning, uh, which is what we're going to go over, the Q value estimates. And with red, it's the without double, uh, without double Q learning, the Q value estimates. And then the bars here you can see are the ground truth, what the Q values actually should be. And you can see that the blue is a lot closer. They're still overestimating a little bit, but it's a lot closer to what it actually should be. Um, and this ends up having sort of good results on the, uh, if we scroll down, uh, these are, again, the blue here is the with WQ learning and the red is without. Uh, and this is the performance on various Atari games. And what you can see is that with WQ learning, almost always, uh, almost always double Q learning is outperforming the without double Q learning. Um, so, so that's sort of an overview of what double Q learning is. So the next question is, how do we implement this? You know, uh, taking out the air, that seems like it might be a fairly difficult thing, uh, but it actually turns out to be really easy. Uh, so let's go back to, where was it? Uh, here it is. So this is our update function right now, right? Um, this is what we're trying to target, what we want our Q values to be, right? It's the reward plus the discounted Q value at the next step, um, specifically the Q values from the target network. Uh, the target network is, is the secondary network we use, the stable network. Um, and if you don't remember what that is or don't know what that is, definitely check out uh, the video before this on Q learning. I, I explain what that is. 
but sort of the idea in Q-learning is we kind of want to separate out the two parts that choose what action has the max Q value and then actually assessing what that maximum Q value is. Uh, so that might be a little confusing just saying it like that. So let's scroll down a little bit. So what's actually happened here? Well, we can see that this entire component here has just been expanded into this. The function's essentially been decomposed into its parts. Um, so there's two things happening right here. The first is the argmax, and then we're taking the Q value of, of, the, of that inner component. Uh, so let's look at the argmax first, this inner component. And what you can see is that first, we take this Q value uh, and we take essentially whatever Q value, we take the action that gives us the highest Q value, right? So maybe that's the second action or it's the fourth action. Uh, it doesn't really matter. We just take which action has the highest Q value and get that action. And then we take that action and we get the value of that Q value, um, right? So if we take action two, uh, if this gives us action number two, then this would give us the Q value of action number two. Right. Um, so if I were to write that down real quick, right, if we have action number one with a Q value of one, action number two with a Q value of 82 and action number three with a Q value of negative five, you know, well, first we say which one's the max. Uh, 82 is obviously the max. So this would the first inner part would return um, action two or action one if we're indexing. If this is zero, one, two, we take action one. Um, then we say, OK, let's get the Q value for action one. So if this is like Q values, then we would say the Q values action one, and that would give us 82, right? So, so we're still getting the 82, and we're just turning this uh, one-step process of taking the max into a two-step process. Uh, now, this seems a little bit, you know, why would we be turning, why would we just be making it more complicated? And the reason is we actually want to change just one of these. So if we go up to what they actually do, um, and, and even before we do that, let me just sort of tell you how double Q learning works on a theoretical level. Essentially, what we're trying to do is use two Q networks, one to do the inner arg max, essentially the one that chooses which Q value is the maximum Q value. And then we use a separate Q network to actually figure out what value that is, right? So we're decoupling this process by using, oh, I deleted it, but, uh, or did I? Uh, no, okay. So we're decoupling this process with this process uh, by using two different Q networks. And the reason is even if we choose one that's overestimated on step one, well, it's not guaranteed that it will be overestimated on this step two. It could be overestimated or under or, or underestimated at this point. So that will essentially help us, you know, not always choose just the overestimated ones. Well, we'll always choose the, we'll still choose them, but we won't end up using the overestimated values, which ends up helping us out a lot. Um, so the only difference here and if you, I can't like it, let's see if I can get these. Yeah, it's kind of small, but you'll see the only difference is we have a little uh, tick here at the top, uh, the prime. This essentially just means we're using the target network for this outside step, for the step that actually decides what the key values are. Um, so that was a lot of talk, just going over it real quickly, uh, whole thing, right? So when we're doing Q learning, Q learning algorithms tend to overestimate Q values and to compensate for that, we essentially want to still choose the action that gets the maximum Q value, but then evaluate what that Q value is with a different network in the hopes that we won't be always using an overestimated Q value. And that should in turn help our estimations and in turn, you know, help the algorithm progress uh, farther, do better and be more stable. Uh, so let's actually go ahead and implement that. Uh, it's actually super simple. So let's go down here. Uh, so train on batch. This is our function where we do the uh, training, right? So right now we get our Q values uh, using the target model. Then we, what do we do? Max next Q values. Uh, we take the max, right? So this is essentially that max part we had right there. Um, and then and then we calculate the, uh, what is this? We All the other stuff we need, right? But this is kind of the focus right here, right? This is the uh, max, you know, the discount times the, well, we don't have this count here, but times the max over the Q values. That's what this is. So let's first decompose this, right? Uh, so how are we going to decompose this? Uh, this actually isn't gonna be too hard. The first thing we want to do 
is instead of taking this zero, so uh, when you take a, the zeroth index of a match in Torch is the max value where is one is the index of the max value. So we're turning this into an argmax. Uh, so max next, let's call this max next actions. All right, uh, okay. Uh, so we have the argmax, let's go back here. Or what's that? Yeah, so we have the argmax now. This is what we're doing. So next, we need to actually get the Q value from that. So how do we do that? Well, let's say the target next Q values equals target model dot forward uh, next observation. And you might say, isn't this the same as this? Uh, yes, it is. But remember, we're going to we're going to decouple. We're just decoupling it now. Then we'll deal with the uh, using different models. So we have the Q values again, uh, and then we want to get the max Q value, right? So the max next uh, Q values equals target next Q values dot gather. Um, so we have our Q values, and we're going to gather the indices that are the max uh, of all the Q values. So the index is going to equal max next x dot u negative one. One and the reason we have to sort of do this viewing and gather these indices is because remember we're training in batches, uh, so we have to get the max key values for each batch, and we're doing this over the first dimension. And then uh, we have so that's sort of this part right here. We're getting the whole key value now, uh, and then finally all we need to do is reform out this max next q values equals max next q. Ooh values dot view negative one dot detach awesome uh, so we're just essentially making this a yeah yeah we're, we're just uh, squeezing this essentially uh, and then detaching it so we don't uh, back propagate on this essentially right now we have essentially done exactly what we wanted we're getting max next key values uh, so we have the inner part of the function the outer part of the function here and if we look back, remember the only difference that we need to make was we need to change the outer function that gets the max Q values to the target network. So they're actually both using the target network right now. So really we want to change the inner part, the argmax, to use the uh, normal model, not the target network. So this is, remember, the inner part. We can just change target model itself. Now we're using um, the normal model. Uh, so this should actually work. Uh, Wait one sec, I'll go ahead and run this. That's all we needed to do. Double key learning is very simple to implement. Um, I just want to make sure that it runs. Let's make sure we've made no mistakes. So we can run this, run this, run this. Let's see. Does the training work? We'll find out shortly. Oh, there we go. Okay. Let's just wait for one more update. And then I think we should be able to call it a success. Okay, I'm back. That didn't take too long at all. Looks like it's working. Um, I'm not gonna wait for this whole thing to go because uh, it, it'll actually take a while, you know, um, not the quickest process, but awesome. We got it working, super simple. I just wanna show you guys the results. If we actually scroll down here, I have a graph of what I was doing before. Um, we get up to roughly, roughly 20. Um, after how many episodes is that? 1,750 episodes, we get roughly 20 reward or so on average, maybe a little bit below that. Um, it hasn't changed all too much from the last one, so you might be like, were you lying to us? Uh, <laughs> does double key learning really work that well? And it does, it does. Uh, so let me actually pull up the paper. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Is this it? I think this is it. If you actually scroll down here and we look at, uh, where is it? We're doing breakout, right? So breakout, breakout. Uh, DQN, double DQN, it actually does do slightly worse on breakout. And this is sort of, I think, a good lesson to learn. Uh, you know, these sorts of improvements don't improve everything. There's very rarely a paper that will come out with a new method or a new improvement that will work better on every single environment. Um, oftentimes, it really just depends. Uh, anyway, this does help in the majority of cases. Um, and you do see it, I think, in a lot of Q-learning based papers. So I wanted to share it. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Definitely like and subscribe if you thought the video was helpful. I really appreciate it. 
And definitely check in next time because we are going to be going over dueling Q networks, which are also very important. So hope to see you there. Thanks for watching.